Worshippers, it's good for us to think about God's good gifts to us on a regular basis and how those gifts might impact our lives. I'm Pastor Kurt Lemko, coming to you through the support of Christ Lutheran Church in Rochester, Minnesota. Today there's some emphasis on the shepherd theme. So the psalm for the day is the 23rd Psalm, the Good Shepherd Psalm. The Old Testament lesson talks about the shepherds of Israel not being so great. So we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So far the psalm, you notice it goes from a physical support. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and so forth to finally a spiritual promise, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That movement is kind of evident in the rest of our service this morning as well. But in the Old Testament, there is a warning that the leaders are not doing what they should to shepherd God's people, Israel. It was a good time physically for the people, and it seems when things are good, people tend to fall away from God, especially the leaders. The Old Testament from Jeremiah 23, beginning at the first verse. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. So far, the Old Testament lesson. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at the 11th verse. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the reading of the epistle. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to them, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What do you see? That's the question of the day. Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. What you see depends on your attitude. Plans change when we see different things. I remember when we were going on a little trip and uh, we were going to stay over at a motel, but when we got there, we found out that our car had a flat tire. So that changed the order and the timing of our plans. Obviously, first we had to get that tire fixed before we could move. Jesus, when he saw the people, he was on his way really to give rest to his disciples. They had been working hard and he recognized that. And he said, come away, let's find a solitary place and get some rest. But when he got there, he saw the huge crowd. But Jesus saw more than a crowd. He saw individual people, people who were exhausted, people who were with needs, people who needed words of hope, words of power, words of life, and his plans changed. Now he would not rest, but he would meet the needs of those individual people one by one as they came to him, even when he was at the point of exhaustion. How about us? Lots of times we are kind of overwhelmed and uh, somebody comes and has a need. And a lot of people will see for instance, a problem kid. And the kid is really just 
a pain for people to deal with. But others see that kid and see someone with needs, someone who is trying to figure out who he is, trying to find some meaning in life. I remember in my high school class, there were three people that uh, you would not think would make much of their lives. One simply didn't do any schoolwork. I don't know if he flunked things and gave him another chance or how that was, but he, he did graduate with us. And uh, there was another one who was, uh, well, kind of unruly, shall we say. <laughs> He was the one who would disrupt things. And when he was out on the road, you wouldn't want to be riding with him because he was not exactly what you'd call a safe driver. And there was another one who always slept in class. Now that one eventually became the mayor of his town. And the one who was disruptive became a very successful businessman. And the first one who didn't do his work became responsible person in a large company. Go figure. But individually, at that point in their lives, they were not someone that you would look up to or think would be very successful. Jesus saw people as individuals, not just the outside, but the inside. And so he did what he could to meet their needs, to help them grow to enable them to become the people that God meant for them to be. And so for those who are like Jesus, they see in people, not just the disruptions and the challenges, but they see a person loved by God in need of Jesus and his promises. I remember a story about a voters meeting at a church and people were at each other and literally yelling at each other and <clears throat> the pastor finally thought he should do something and so he one by one took the two enemies aside and said just remember that person at whom you are yelling is one for whom Christ died and suddenly the whole tenor of the meeting changed and they got done what they needed to get done. So Jesus has an effect. When people receive his care, good things happen. And how did it start? Well, when he got there and found the crowd, it says he had compassion on them. Compassion is an interesting word. If you take it apart, the C-O-M is sometimes the basis of with, the word with in the Latin language. And so passion, compassion, passion is intense feeling. So you put them together, compassion, it would be intense feeling with those people who are suffering. And we see that coming out in Jesus many times in his ministry. There was the incident with the widow from Nan. Remember, her son had died. They were taking him out to bury him. And Jesus met them and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And so many needs which the lady would have as a widow in Israel were wiped away with one word. Another incident is when Jesus encountered a leper in Mark chapter 1, and he cared for him. Blind men, Matthew 28, Jerusalem, the city. He said, how often I would have gathered you under my wings as a chicken gathers her chicks under the wings, but you would not. And so he has compassion. He feels deeply for all those people affected in those situations and helps when he can. Now many times his help is rejected, and that's just the way it is. He finally just says, okay. But in Psalm 23, you see movement. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's physical. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, okay? But then it moves toward the spiritual side of life. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and finally at the end, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The compassion of Jesus works the same way. In this particular story, he meets the physical needs of the people, but then it also moves toward the spiritual side of life. His compassion leads to action, and it goes beyond the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 people. He has compassion for them, and he lets them understand that there is more to life than that particular miracle of food. Now, Jesus had compassion to help them, but his ultimate compassion was the compassion of the cross. He cared so much and so deeply, and so, shall we say it, passionately, that he was ready to lay down his life, which reminds us of that place where Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How much more could anyone expect of a shepherd than to be willing to lay down his life to protect them and give them a better life? But when you stop and think about it, we have some of that kind of thing going on day by day. Life itself is a miracle. I woke up this morning and guess what? I was breathing. <laughs> I didn't do anything to make that happen. It just happened. My heart was beating steadily and my brain waves were going back and forth. My brain was ticking away. And I didn't do anything to make that happen. And yet, I was participating in that utterly strange power we call life, which surges through us as a gift from God. When we see it in those terms, it makes us also want to respond as Jesus responded to the needs of people. We can't save the world, but in this particular passage, where we, he, we see people hungry and Jesus feeding them, reminds us that, you know, maybe there is something we could do. He doesn't say, save the world. He just says, start in, you know, give them what you have. And the disciples did that. We have something in our church called Lutheran World Relief. And through that organization, we have the opportunity to do something, right? To start in, to meet the needs of people, and also hope that that will lead to the spiritual feeding and the promise that they have not just life here, but life with God forever. Amen. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Powerful and loving God, you showed your connection with your creation again as you made the feeding of the 5,000 possible. Let this event point the leaders of the world to you so that they also reflect your caring and compassionate work to support the homeless, 
the ill, the discouraged, and all who struggle in any way in their nations. And as individual people, let this also inspire us to do what we can. Let our compassion for the hungry also lead to action, to do just what we can to alleviate the problems that people have. Lord, you have made and given us sunshine, the snow, the rain, and the sunset. You have created a world of season, rhythms, moods, a world of sunrises and eclipses, incoming and outgoing tides, cold fronts and heat waves. Make man the guardian and keeper of the days and nights, the winters and springs, the waves and the winds. Make us glad for the earth's rhythm and rhyme in which we were born to laugh and cry, to live and die and rise. Fix our hearts on Christ, the first fruit of all creation. In his name we pray, who has also taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.